And you know, Caesar in America, that's us. We are Caesar. So it's very important for us to participate and let our voices be heard and our values be counted. Third most important concept found in the Declaration with regard to what's different about our system. They said that we're endowed by our Creator. You see, they have God at the center of our equation of freedom. Now, a lot of people out there today, and I know some in this room, don't like that idea. They don't want God in the equation of freedom. Uh, we, maybe they prefer that we start a new society and that we all just get together and we, you know, put on our tie-dye shirts and we stand around the trees and we hold hands and we sing kumbaya to each other. We look at each other and we say, there's no God, so we're just going to be smart, rational folks here. And I'll confer freedom upon you and, and you confer freedom upon me and we'll live happily ever after. But we won't. There's this thing that's recognized as the depravity of man. And there will be a group sooner or later among us that will become stronger than the others. that will begin to take away our freedoms. What do we do? Not much. Because if your freedom comes from your neighbor, your neighbor can take it away from you. If your freedom comes from government, government can take it away from you. I'm here to tell you tonight, the reason you have freedom in this nation is because our government officially recognizes the fact that we are, we are all equal and we have those freedoms because those freedoms come from a higher source. The reason we have equal protection is because the freedom comes from a higher source. It does not come from each other. And that is what separates us from every other nation ever birthed in the history of the world. Uh, this is a concept that a lot of people want, you know, will say, well, we're not a nation uh, under God. We're a nation just under law or under man. And whoever happens to be elected at the time, uh, that's what the principles will be in our nation. That's not what the Founding Fathers told us. John Jay, first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he said, if you're going to protect freedom, here's what you better do. To the most effectual means of securing the continuance of our civil and religious, notice it does not say just religious. We're not talking about how you worship, just how you worship on Sunday morning or whether or not you can pray or choose not to pray. It's both the civil and religious liberties. Is always remember with reverence and gratitude the source from which they flow. That's step number one, if we're going to protect freedom and preserve it for future generations, is to honor the source of that freedom and to do so not only privately, but publicly. John Adams, uh, obviously our second president and instrumental in the birth of our nation, said the safety and prosperity of nations ultimately and essentially depend on the protection and blessing of Almighty God. The national acknowledgement of this truth is not only an indispensable duty which the people owe to him, but a duty whose natural influence is favorable to the promotion of that morality and piety without which social happiness cannot exist, nor the blessings of a free government be enjoyed. It's basically saying, if you want to have a successful society, if you want to personally have a happy social life, if you want freedom to survive in this country, back up to where he started. It's the acknowledgement of the protection and blessing of God. The national acknowledgement, not a personal acknowledgement, the national acknowledgement. That's why you had founding father after founding father, whether it's president or governor or uh, some other capacity, some of them as judges, actually publicly acknowledging that our freedom comes from God and we must honor him. Of course, nowadays the opposite is done. Our courts tell us you can't pray at a public school. You can't have the Bible uh, taught at a public school. This one, by the way, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, easy to prove the court wrong on this. Encourage you to read the uh, Notre Dame Law Review of uh, November 2003, where we have an extensive uh, article in there that documents for you how the founding fathers wanted the Bible in the classroom. In fact, the Bible you're looking at there is one that's in our collection of law builders. It's called the Aiken Bible. It's the first Bible printed in America. It was printed by Congress, quote, for the use of our schools. Now, what kind of yahoos in Congress didn't understand that that's supposedly unconstitutional to put the Bible in our schools? It's the founding fathers, one of the first laws passed in America. They talk about the fact Benjamin Rush, for instance, father of our public school system under the Constitution, also founder of the first Bible Society in America, the Philadelphia Bible Society. He said it's important for every student to study the Bible. He said if we can get everybody to study the Bible and follow what it says, we'll solve slavery, we'll solve crime, we'll get rid of all of our social ills if we'll just study the Bible and follow it. Fisher Ames, guy most of us probably never heard of, he's the congressman that wrote the First Amendment. There in the House, he said the Bible should not only be in our schools, it should be the primary textbook of our schools. Thomas Jefferson himself, not a Christian, uh, when in charge of the D.C. schools, required only two books, the Watts Hymnal and, and the Bible. He recognized how important it was to have the Bible at the forefront of who we are as a nation. Of course, now you can't even pray before a football game, just a ceremonial prayer uh, there on Friday night, student-led by the choice of the student that's actually elected there at that particular school where this case came about. And the Ten Commandments, the court said the case was called Stone v. Graham. They said, that, here's the problem with the Ten Commandments. It, if you put the Ten Commandments on the wall in a school, they said the kids might see them. 
And they said, if they see them, this is their words, not mine, they might read them. And if they read them, well, they might study them. And if they study them, they might obey them. And that would violate the Establishment Clause. So we don't want students to actually study the Ten Commandments. I mean, they might obey, don't kill, don't steal. So instead, what do we do? We teach two new things in our school system in the last 45 years since we've removed these religious principles from our school system. We say, number one, no right and wrong. Oh, it might be wrong for me, doesn't mean it's wrong for you, you know, moral relativism, run amok. You just do whatever you think is right in your own eyes. Oh, and then the second thing we're going to teach, hey, there's no God, there's no creator. That student you're sitting next to, why, they're just randomly gathered protoplasm. They're just a pile of atoms. Why, well, they're an accident. They're not a creative being. So you, you do whatever you think is right in your own eyes. And then we're shocked that they can walk into a classroom, take out a gun, and murder their classmates. We put a formula in place that says to our young people and says to our society, there is no value in life. You do whatever you think is right. You didn't learn about Paducah and Pearl and Jonesboro and Littleton. It didn't happen 50 years ago. It happens every few months in this country now, and you don't even read about it. It's on the back page of the paper unless it's as bad as what happened at Virginia Tech. Folks, guns were easier to get 50 years ago than they are today. I can put my 40 caliber Glock up here, and we can all stand around and chant all we want. It will not jump up and shoot anybody. All right? It, it's not the gun. The heart of man. The value system. That's what we change. And we get a very different result in our culture as a result. Well, of course, we've got the Ninth Circus uh, Court of Appeals out there on the left coast telling us that the Pledge of Allegiance is even unconstitutional. And uh, it goes on and on and on. You can get, uh, if you want to know all the deep, a much longer presentation on it is, is America One Nation Under God, you can get it at our website. But let me just fly through some of these founding fathers and, and answer this question of, of whether or not the founding fathers were in fact Christians, whether or not they intended for faith to not only be part of our private lives, but also our public lives. You've all heard the other arguments. I'm sure you're taught them on this campus in many of your classes and some of your professors that will tell you the founding fathers were not Christians. Uh, the founding presidents were not Christians. We had an unchristian beginning in America. All these guys were atheists, agnostics, and deists. Anybody ever heard that? Nobody in this room ever heard that. Wow, okay. So, it's the truth. All right, well, let's find out tonight if it's the truth. And this ain't going to be my words or your words. We're going to go to their words. Let's find out what they actually said, not what some liberal professor decides to say about it. So, are they all atheists, agnostics, and deists? You might be even learning from the textbook. Uh, oh, I don't have a slide of it up there. No, I did. Uh, the Godless Constitution. Everybody ever had to use that in their classroom? Godless Constitution. Somehow what made us great is our godlessness. Uh, when you get those kind of books, be sure and look in the back. The Godless Constitution, for instance, go to the back where you get your end notes. You know, you want to look for the documentation to see if it is, in fact, the truth. And all they say is in a little paragraph, well, we've dispensed with the normal scholarly method of end notes because what we're saying is so well known, uh, we don't need to document it. Uh, you're not going to find that in our books. Go to our website, you'll find about a third of the book is going to be the actual bibliography and the documentation of the different things that I'm going to share with you today. But let's look at the impact that that type of teaching that says... Founding fathers didn't want God in the system, so let's get God out of the system. Most of us today, most people today say, you know, I don't know what the founders believed or said or did, but those nine geniuses on the Supreme Court, surely they know. They know more about the law and the Constitution and the founding fathers than anybody else. They say the Bible, you know, the founding fathers didn't want the Bible or prayer or any of those things in our public life. It must be the case. So we kind of buy into whatever those nine geniuses say instead of going to the original documentation. And teaching this philosophy on campuses has an impact on our nation. The more students that leave this campus or any other campus with this idea that, that the right worldview is to keep God out of the equation and have a secular humanistic approach that says there is no right and wrong, let's have moral relativism. This worldview that says religious principles, moral values, any concept of right and wrong, we've got to keep it away from civil government. It impacts our nation. It has an impact on what you can or can't do or say in public. A great example is high school graduations. Think about some of the cases that have come down the last few years. Dobie Santa Fe, I'm embarrassed to say, comes out of the state of Texas. Uh, as you folks outside of Texas know, uh, we Texans are a little bit proud. I know you think we're just obnoxious, but you got to understand when you're raised in the state of Texas, Dane, don't nod your head when I say we're obnoxious. Um, you got to understand when you're raised in the state of Texas, you're about 15 before you find out there are other states out there. Okay, that's just that's just the way they, they do us back in Texas. And I, I blame my Texas pride on, on uh, President Bush. My first term in the legislature, he was uh, governor of Texas still. And, and I got to know him a little bit then, but I had interviewed him a long time before that. I was doing a documentary on the, on the greatest president of the last century, President Ronald Reagan. And as I was doing this, I knew some of y'all liked that comment. Um, as I was doing this uh, documentary about President Reagan, uh, I, I got to interview all these people. And I, I went around, I interviewed Trent Lott and Dick Cheney and all these folks that had been part of the, uh, the 1981 tax cuts, the Kemp Rock tax cuts that uh, 
have given us you know, 20, 25 years of unprecedented economic growth. And as I'm interviewing,